he seemed to do a lot of work in like rhythmic behavior, which is stuff like breathing and swimming and stuff like that, where these neurons kind of put out a, a pulse, a steady like rhythm of, of pulse. And then these neurons connect to other neurons, and depending on how they're connected or whatever the chemical properties or whatever, okay, uh, some neurons can inhibit and some neurons can excite other neurons. So if you have a pulse coming in, by a pulse coming in, that may cause you to pulse or that may cause you to slow down pulsing or whatever, right? So these behaviors are very complex like, because what happens is, you know, one's feeding into one, which is feeding into two, which is feeding into another one, which may end up coming back, who knows, right? So there's all these complex behaviors, but um, they have all, con they, what he's doing is he has like a little piece of software that he, um, that apparently is very popular in the neuron behavior world or whatever, that models some of these networks. So it's a little, it's a program that you feed in a map and the properties of the connections of, of, of the neurons, and then you give it some parameters like an input or whatever. It goes through the network and then spits out a result, okay? And what he's interested in is looking at how these, these kind of neural networks behave in all situations. In other words, uh, no matter what input I, I, I give it, uh, he knows what the output will be instead of having to run through the simulation, okay? So um, this is actually a common type of application um, that you see, especially in high-performance computing. Uh, it's when you try all the inputs to something to see what the outputs are, right? If you have some sort of simple formula that you can do, you don't need to do that, right? Because if the simple formula, you can just, whatever input you have, you calculate the formula. Like you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't sweep all the possible numbers for square root, right? Because we have a very simple way of calculating square root, right? But if you have these very complex nonlinear behaviors like, like these neurons, right? Then parameter sweep can make sense. What you do is you try all the inputs, you go through all of them, and, and record all the outputs and match them up, right? So your final results are, a big table of all the inputs you use and all the outputs you got. Okay, so this kind of application is a parameter sweep application. Okay, um, and parameter sweep applications are very good for parallel computing, right? Because if it's all independent runs of a program just with different inputs and then you're recording the output, you just divide up the inputs and right the sets of input give them to a bunch of machines, let them run through all those calculations, map them up, match them up, and then you collect the results. Okay? So, this was an interesting app that even with the basic understanding of what we have of, like, for example, cord networks and things like that, we have most of the information we need to write a distributed application at that point, right? So, let's think about this. We're doing a parameter. Does everybody get the idea? You have. Um, it's on. You hit it again. See if it'll kick the fan on. Ah, there we go. Yeah, that sh should do it. It should kick on a little bit. Okay, cool. So, um, if you're doing a parameter sweep app. So, what do we start off with? What are the pieces we have? Okay, I'm doing this neural, neuronal behavior parameter sweep. So, what do we got? Okay, so we got we got we got the, the parameters. We have the parameters themselves, right? And then we also have the uh, we also have the uh, um, kind of the range that we want for those parameters. So, let's say we have input A. We have A, B, and C, okay? And then we have a range for each of those. Let's say just like 1 through uh, 10,000, right? And we have 1 through uh, 20, and we have 1 through uh, 100. What else do we have? Okay, so we have some sort of, some sort of algorithm or something that we need to run through, right? So we have some sort of function, right, that takes A, B, and C, right? 
and this function spits out some sort of output, right? All that happens, okay? So, what is the final, like, uh, if we run through a perimeter sweep, what do we have at the end? So we have a, this function is our program, is his neural map program or whatever. So in this case, he has another input, which is his map. Okay, so he has, let's say, let's say he has a map as well. So we have a map as well, right? So these are inputs, uh, this is our function. So what, what should our result of a run look like? A single run. What's that? All, I, well, map. well, we have our inputs. We ran them through the map using f of abc. And we got x. So what do we want to report? We don't just want to report x, right? We need a, b, and c map to x, right? So basically, our, our output is like a row, right, of, of, a, of a table. And that row is, uh, you know, the value of a, right, a, uh, y, right? Uh, b, y, c, y, and x, y, for run y, right? Because we need to remember which of the inputs we put in there. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we're going to do this for all y that can handle every combination of these. Right? So how many runs will we have? Huh? We'll have y. What's the range of y? Ten thousands times twenty times one hundred, right? Because we need every combination. So there's ten thousand possible A's matched up with twenty possible B's matched up with a hundred possible C's, right? And that's a lot, and that's good, right? We're glad that it's a lot because if it weren't a lot, they wouldn't need us, right? Just run it. If it's ten, they just run it ten times. They're not impressed by it, right? So we we need to run a lot, okay? So the other thing that's interesting is that y, right, this, this y value is going to be basically from, uh, from 0 to this combination, right? So, uh, you know, 10,000 times 20 times 100, right? Okay, so basically we could essentially map every y into all the inputs. So we have, we have our choice of how we store this part of it. We could just store y and know how y maps onto the individual a, b, and c. Or we could just store a, b, and c knowing that that's, that represents one run, right? One of the y's, okay? So that's what we're looking at. So the obvious way to parallelize this, not knowing anything about the program, right, is just divide up the y's. So if we have four people, what do we want to do? Yeah, split y into quarters, and each of us run a quarter of y, okay? Preferably, we do it in chunks so that we don't have to remember the individual runs that you did, right? It doesn't make sense for me to do, you know, the first eight and the last eight while you guys do the middle three quarters, right? Because then now I have to track where I started, where I stopped, where I started, where I stopped. Whereas if I do a contiguous block, it's simple, right? I just remember the first value, the last value, and I know I did everything in between. Right? Okay. So, that's our strategy. Our strategy is let's take all these different possible combinations of inputs, divide it among our peers, run them, record these values, spit the values back, and then so at the end, hopefully one of us has all the answers after they're all consolidated. Pretty good, because, I mean, we're going to get, you know, approaching linear speed up from how we divide it up, because there's the only, what's the overhead? Okay, well, first of all, we need to, we need to give each other, we, we all need the program, right? We all need the neuron program. We all need the map. And then the other thing we receive is a range, 
right, a range of y that we're going to calculate. And then we have the other overhead of the output that we produce. We're going to send that somewhere, right? There's other approaches where if this is like an online pro, like a program that you run, you know, that you can sit there and say, I need to know the value for uh, this output for this range. Then you can go out and query if you want it, but chances are we're going to dump all these back to one place so that this person has all the results and then they can run all fancy analysis and stuff like that on all the, all the final results, right? Okay, so our main overhead is our main kind of upstream overhead or input, right, is the program, the map, and then a range, right? And then our output is a set of uh, basically y to x mappings. Not bad. I mean, that's pretty small, right? It's basically two numbers. It's our y, and then x might be a set, or it might be, you know, it might be a large set, who knows, but it's basically all the, out the output of this program, and then a y, a little index, okay? So, that seems pretty easy, but How do we start up? We start up, we're all just sitting here running nothing, right? Okay. We decide, okay, I want to join this community of people studying neurons, right? So what do we need first? I'm 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 the project, I'm I'm the project lead, okay? I'm running this program. So what do you think I start doing? I'll just start running it, right? With whatever I got, my one computer, I'll just start calculating all of them. Right? Because if nobody joins, what's the best I can do? Run it all by myself, right? Okay. So now I run this kind of peer-to-peer -peer layer. I run the program and I start running on all of them. What do you guys do? You guys want to contribute to the to humanity, so you decide, you know what? I really need to do something worthwhile and I'm gonna join this parameter sweep neuron mapping project. Okay, so I say, okay, cool. Well, you need this peer-to-peer -peer software. And what? What else do I need to give you? What's that? Okay, do we want to do that like this? Talking to each other? What's the minimum amount of information I can give you? The peer-to-peer -peer layer and what? My machine that's running it. Right? Because we want an automatic mechanism for this to... Get out there, because the more I have to give you in that first step, the less likely you're going to help, right? If I can make it so that it's just install the app, here's my IP, punch this IP address in it, or I hard code the IP address in the app, bad idea probably, but uh, or at least have a default, right? And I give that to you. You go home, you go down your machine, you load up that software and run it. Good. Okay. So now, what do we need to make sure our software does at this point? So now it needs to get the rest of it, right? So getting the program, right, the neuron program, and getting the map, that's not too hard, right? You just say, I'm starting up. I don't have anything. I know, well, okay, I know you need the neuron, the, the, the neuron program. I can upload that to you, right? And I know you need the map because there's one map for my run. That's pretty easy. In other words, that's the stuff that's the same for everybody. So now we're at the hard part, and that is what? Yeah, delegating all the work. So what do we do? What what's what are some approaches? Okay, so one thing I can do is I could divvy up everything already and then give you like a block and then you can go calculate the block and then when you're done, you give back to me and then I give you another block. What's a drawback to that approach? Right. I become the server essentially, and then everybody's the client. Okay, so if we're gonna go headlong peer to peer, what is the initial strategy when one of you contacts me? Not a block. 
if you have, right? And then you start doing that. So that's the ideal split, right? Is you do half, I do half, good to go. Okay? So then what happens? What, what's the next problem? Okay, well, I just say, just give me all the results. And I'll be the bottleneck here, but I don't, there's not really a way around the final step of me getting all the results. I mean, there's some strategies we can do later on once we see kind of how this pans out, but the final aspect of you giving me all the results we can't get around. Okay, so a third person comes in. First of all, they can talk to either of us, right? And they join our peer-to-peer -peer network, so what do we do now? Right. We probably each want to split and give them, give the new person a third of each of ours. Would be ideal, right? Yeah, because we'd each have. That would split it into. That would end up splitting it into thirds, right? If I give, if I give one, if I give the new person a third, they give the new person person a third. I am left with two thirds of what I originally had. They're left with two thirds of what I originally had. And they're left. So we got, uh, we have, we have, it all split up into thirds. So then the next person comes in, then we split those, right? We'll run into problems with that too, right? Every person coming in having to talk to every other person in the network already could be bottlenecks as well, okay? We know a way to do this here. Well, we might need to replicate. We might need to. That's that's a more advanced feature, though. We're not we're not worried about that yet. Okay. We what I'm saying is is this division problem. We have a way to do it. Consistent hashing, right? Okay, because we've only talked about one other technique, right? And that's cord, right? So, <laughs> so the answer is cord. Okay, the answer is going to be cord. Okay. What does cord attempt to do? Across, across the peers, right? And as it does that, I mean, there are times when it's when, when there's, you know, varying levels. But overall, in the long run, Cord's whole goal is to spread out keys, okay? How does it do, it, how does it do that? How does it do that with hashing? Right, so all the possible outputs, it tries to distribute across. So in our case, what do we want to have? The ranges. The ranges. So in other words, why? Right? Huh? We yeah. want to hash why. Yeah. Right? Because if we hash why and map that to on all the peers, what does consistent hashing do for us? It should spread why across all the peers. Right? There's still a problem with this. Now that's individual wise spread across the peers. Okay. So we may need to break down into blocks. I don't know. But there needs to be something as far as how we split up using hash. Because if we have a mechanism that splits it, like for example, I don't know, maybe we can hash start values. We have start values and give a link that's not included with the start value. That may give us a potential for have some good fit. Another thing is, is that Cord already does ranges, right? It does these ranges of, of keys. We might be able to do that. Like we might distribute Y kind of without hashing it. In other words, use the range that comes out of the hashes as kind of the no, remember when we did the cord network and each of those cord nodes had kind of an interval that they were responsible for? Well, if you think of all of Y as being the ring, having intervals for each of them may or may not be good. I don't know. Okay? But we need some way to, to kind of exploit that idea that we want to evenly spread across all the peers. So in other words... Ideally, like if the third, if the if the third person comes in, we each want to give that third person a portion. But we might not do that. We might just have one person give them a portion and say that 
statistically, the other person is going to give a portion away to the next person. Right? Because that's what Cord does, right? What does Cord do with it with all the keys when a new node joins? Right. So when the new node comes in, just by virtue of the, the hashing and stuff, it's automatically responsible for some keys, right? So it just finds out where those keys are and then takes responsibility for them. So what happens? That node, that successor, that used to be the successor for, for this, gives up those, it takes those keys, replicates them, or copies them to us instead, right? Transfers them to us and then isn't responsible for them. Okay? So, <clears throat> but we want to do something along those lines, right? We want to have Y break up on its own these nodes compute those portions and then send back the results. Okay, sending back the results, we may just have kind of some master that gets you know the, the person who started the project, for example, might be one of the per, the parameters. Can we do anything to help with sending those back? They all eventually have to get to the project leader, right? But what things can we do that can help with sending it back? What's that? Okay, like interleaving might 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 be helpful. Hope chances are we wouldn't be able to coordinate something like that. But hopefully they'll interleave on their own. Right? Just by virtue of the fact that some are faster, some are slower, some are doing bigger ranges, some are doing smaller ranges. Do I want to report back a result after every run every Y? Probably not, right? Because every time that we start talking to somebody there's overhead in setting up the connection. Yes, we're transferring a particular amount of data, you know, sending, you know, 100 bytes is sending 100 bytes. But there's always a little bit of overhead at the front. So the more, the smaller the percentage of overhead that you can put on there, the better efficiency you're getting. Okay? So chances are you want to report a whole block, right? Knowing that, what are some things that we can do to help with transfer at that point? Blocks different sizes, so because, so because if they're different sizes, that will help with kind of this different times that people are sending, right? What's another thing we can do? What about consolidating blocks on the network before they send them back? Right. In other words, let people consolidate some of their answers before they return them to me, right? We're still doing additional work, right? Because... You two talk. You, you guys are taking the hit of overhead if you're talking to each other, right? It's more but it's right because you're doing like you're getting a bigger chunk that you can send to me all at once. Right. The whole point is is I don't care if I waste some of your resources because I'm I'm the I'm the bottleneck, right? And we're trying to reduce me being the bottleneck. So if I can get it down to just a few people sending me results and everybody else is kind of consolidating them out on the network, that's good. Okay, so if we're, we're going to do this, what do we need to write? What do we need to write? Okay, so some like protocol that, that, that we need so that we can negotiate all this stuff, right? So what kind of functions, do, functionality do we And I'll give you TCP IP. <laughs> no, we also have, you know, I mean, you know, Juxta and all these things, you know. We potentially have that as well. What does Juxta give us? What kind of functionality does Juxta give us? Right, ways to find peers. And what else? Like what? Right, so you can kind of report kind of information about the node. What else? What's another very fundamental thing that it, it, it makes easy? What's the first thing that we have to do, for example, one of our first tasks is distributing, what's it called, is distributing the program. Do you want to write another file transfer protocol? Probably not. Juxta has pipes and things and 
right? And, and it can it can set up communicate if if you know what a, 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 who a peer is, you can transfer them a file, right? If you say if you have Jixa, you can transfer them a file if you know a peer. You don't have to worry about how you route it. Jixa is supposed to take care of. I will route it to them and transfer the file and give you some sort of AI hey, transfer the file. Okay, so we have some you know some some primitive operations like you know these pipes for data transfer. Okay, we kind of have like a like a um, like a session to. To network to you know a, a stack that lets us work with peers as like these identifications right these peer identities in other words networks are set up in layers right typically and we do that so that as you get to higher layers you get more functionality as far as like more abstracted things we don't want to sit there and, and, and worry about how I put this on Ethernet and then the Ethernet ends up putting it onto frame relay which ends up putting it onto you know, a cable modem, which ends up going on to your wireless network at home and all that stuff, right? So we have these layers. The next layer up, we'll have network where we have these IP addresses. But then we don't want to work with IP addresses because then we'd have to keep track of them all, right? So then we go to the layers above that. We'll get to transport. And then typically that's where TCP IP stops is transport. Just this kind of higher level where they start adding session and presentation type layers. Okay. Everybody remember your stack? Uh, physical network, right? Physical network transport, and then you start getting into session presentation of an application, right? Typically, we throw away the top three because people found transport was good enough, okay? But as you get into more complex networks, get into something like session where we can talk about each other. There's kind of a faux session layer on TCP IP, and that's DNS, right? We have an application layer DNS where we can kind of map from these mnemonic names to IP addresses, right? Well, we go even further and say, if I have a Juxta ID, I can go from there, right? I have a Juxta ID, the stack will take care of getting the data to you, okay? So, we have pipes for data transfer. We have like a session management, right? We have like a session manager for, for dealing with how we talk to each other, okay? So, we have those, okay? And then we have some, you know, some some kind of luxury services like, you know, being able to search for, like, report things about ourselves, like processing power and stuff like that. Find applications and whatnot. I haven't gotten deep enough into Juxta to see, like, how their, for example, uh, their application services kind of layer that they have there where Juxta's built to kind of say, uh, I'm a peer group and we have this application service that we can do. I didn't see, I didn't go deep enough into it, and I don't know if any of you have, of whether it can handle, for example, transferring the module that represents an application service. So I don't know. I don't know if you set up, here's an application service, this is its ID, and here's a, a jar associated with it, right? That if you join this peer group and want to participate in it, it'll transfer the jar or whatever automatically. I don't know. If it doesn't, we need to write it. Which we can do, right? We have, we have the, a, a primitive that lets us transfer what else do we need to do now? What's the hardest part of this app? Distributing what? Distributing ranges, okay? Distributing ranges we can do, it's kind of doing it on the fly, right? Like kind of running into new peers and saying, oh, I'm going to Break the ranges down even more, right? We start off with range, everything. Okay? Along the lines of range, half is next, right? Where we're kind of dynamically decomposing the problem as we're calculating the problem while we're running the problem. That's the hardest part of the app. Right? So, how do we solve it? And, I mean, it's easy. You just break up the ranges, but... Let's just kind of walk through some of what we'd have to write here. Take it from the perspective of the machine, right? The machine, the, the peer, the single peer that's running this app.
that you're going to get. Let's start from somebody already in the network. Just because I think that might be easier for them. Because we'll do a very, where, where, when somebody joins, that's, that's going to be hard. So, so let's start off with a basic of, the basic thing to do is just write it for the, the unit process. I mean, the single machine, right? Start okay, so start processing. So let's do that. So we start processing, we get a range, right? So let's start at the beginning of the range, right? So let's go through. We'll do, you know, basically um, a, a single run looks like this function call, right? ABC. So we need to. Uh, first, we need to take Y, right, and we need to map it to an ABC, right? Or if we're storing it as ABC, we might already have ABC, but chances are we're going to have, at the very least, a range of A, a range of B, a range of C. So we have to pick one out, right? So we get an ABC. We call F of ABC, right? We get an X, right? And then we need to output in some way. X at ABC, right? So I'll put A, B, C, X. Actually, let's we'll map ABC, or we still have Y, right, from up here. So we'll output X1. Okay, so somewhere we have on disk, I don't know, on keep it in memory, but we have X and Y stored. Okay? So this is, this is our run, and then what do we do? We loop back up, right? So we get, so somewhere up here, we're getting the next, get the next Y, right? And loop, right? we're done. Okay. So that's on a single node, right? <clears throat> so somewhere up here, this is y equals get next. We'll call this, oh, I should have used y because it's like upper or lower case. We'll say uh, z. <laughs> All right. So somewhere up here, z, right, is a set. Right? So we're going to get another one, run through, loop back up, get another one, run through. Okay, so now, let's do the scenario you, you brought up with somebody joins in. Okay, so we, we, we get them the program, we get them the map. We're not really worried about that, cause, <laughs> right? So we send them the program, right? We send them, we, we send them the map. Now, where, where we working on the program, is that Z all the way? Or is it right now, Z is everything, because we're running unit processor. <laughs> right, we're the boss. What essentially do we want to do here? Split what list? Z, right? Split all of Z in half? No, whatever the harmony harmony calculation is. Right, the rest of Z in half, right? Uh, what half? Well, no, no. Give Which half one, is better? The one, give us the one that isn't right where you just finished. Like, you know, not a different block. Than right. What you you want to give them something far from what you're doing. Right. That way you can stay in a range, right? So the end. Right? So maybe give them the end of, of the remaining, right? So with this get next Z, we kind of need to keep track of where we are in it, right? So it needs to be kind of like a like a buffer, right? We need like a buffer of all of them and then some counter saying, 
is where we are in it or something along those lines, right? Um, so we need some sort of like I, right? We need some sort of I saying this is where I am in, in, the, in the stuff, right? When somebody joins in, what will we give them? So we give them n minus i divided by 2. So new peer on a peer join, right, will calculate n minus i over 2, right? And then we'll say uh, you get z of n minus i over 2 to n, right? And what else do we have to keep track of? What else, what else do we need to make sure? We don't want to do it, right? So, <laughs> right? So we'll say J is the end. Okay, so we'll say J equals minus one, whatever. Right? But generally, we'll we'll split it and give them the other half. Okay, that's pretty good, right? Because now, anytime somebody joins, we give them half. Somebody else joins. Hopefully, we can make it so that when they join, they're kind of getting ramped up by a random peer. In other words, they're getting prepped by a, a random peer because we don't want them all to come to us, right? They may come to us to initially find the, the peer group, right? But we want them to kind of, yeah, because if they all come to us, we'll end up with really, really small sets. They'll have really small sets, and. These poor schmoes who just joined at the beginning will have these huge sets and not do, you know, they're just sitting there calculating and they don't have to do any transferring of files and all this stuff, right? That might work, though. I mean, if the, if the, if the calculations are small enough, splitting the load of transferring files, I don't know, but, but typically we'd want them to be kind of random, right? So, this is kind of on, this side over here is kind of somebody that's already on the network, right? So let's, let's take a look at kind of what we do, what we kind of walk through with the peer joining, right? So this is on a, a, on a new peer, right? So we fire up, what's the first thing we do? We fire up our peer-to-peer -peer software and find one of the peers, so right? So talk to our kind of, our, our kind of introductory peer, right? Our introducer, right? Our, I don't know, our known peer. What's that? Yeah, we rendezvous with a peer. Right? The, the, something that's going to connect us to the rest of the network. Okay? So we talk to a known peer. What should that known peer tell us? Okay. So, get assignment or assigned kind of, or assigned. Uh, or uh, orientation peer. <laughs> and we want this to be basically random. Right? Random has a great property of spreading stuff out. Right? So we get assigned an orientation peer who's random. So now what do we do? Okay. So we talk to peer, talk to uh, Talk to OP, our orientation peer, right? And what do we need to get from it? What do we need before that? Mm -hmm. The easy stuff, right? The program and the map. Or the map being, I guess, kind of constant data or the constants, right? The stuff that's not variable for all the different jobs. Okay? You can even consider that the program, part of the program are these constants. Because he can get it from anyone, the best person to get it from is a random peer. Okay, so we get the program, we get the a, a map, right? The neuron map, which is the constants, and then now we have to get a range, right? So now we get basically work units. So meanwhile. 
On the orientation pier, we're running this algorithm, right? We're running this this uh, this function, right? So when we ask for work units, he'll go through and say, "Oh, here's the range I got: splitting, sending." Okay. So we get work units, and then what? Right now we're one of these guys. So now we can go through this regular loop. Now we're missing a step down here, right? Right. Okay. So now we have some additional work that really only applies to people that are already in the peer group, right? Because they're the only ones doing work and stuff. So we can put it over here. Um, we need to basically consolidate output and then what? Do we want to send it to the first person yet? No. So can we do more consolidation? To somebody, right? So which somebody? Okay, we haven't built a cord ring. Yeah. We might. We might build a cord. Send it to the closest person. What's worked out well for us so far? Yeah, either the original or orientation pair you could, but easily easier than that would be consolidate with somebody at random. Right? Choose random peer. Right? And send them send them your consolidated output. Now, there's a problem there. What's that? Yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll choose a random peer that exists. Well, but we can check on that when we're we're choosing a random peer. Right. We need a termination, some sort of condition for for terminating. What are we trying to do by consolidating? Right, in other words, cut down the overhead of setting up a transfer. Okay? Just pick a fairly big range, right? Like fairly uh, a, a byte value, right? Okay? If we know that, you know, a, a, we look at the performance of our peer to ne peer, peer network and we see, okay, what's the kind of typical kind of expected overhead, whether it's overhead in terms of bytes, overhead in terms of latency, how long it takes to set up and everything, of two peers setting up a pipe and sending a file, right? And then we say, okay, that time that we'll make that one percent, or you know, or some tiny percent of how much it takes. And then what do we do? Basically, up here, if threshold send to, I guess the the project leader. So we need the project leader to be one of our constants. You know, that, like with the map, we also give the project leader like the key. Okay. So um, there's really like I mean there seems to be three major jobs here, right? One is this kind of main loop of doing the workload, right? Another one is this being an orienting peer, right? And then there's this kind of output consolidation job. Right? So we want kind of all of those to be pretty pretty independent. Okay. What are the typical communications that we've seen from here that can happen between two different peers? Okay, so let's look at some some scenarios. We have like okay, A will be a peer that's already in the network. Okay? B could potentially be talking to whom? What's that? Okay. So a joining peer, we call him Right? A joining peer could be contacting him to do what? To start the orientation process, right? So an orient message. 
What else? There's another way a joining peer might talk to a peer. Nope. Still a joining peer, so he hasn't done any work. Find an orientation peer, right? So, you could also have another type of message, which is, what do we want to call it? We'll call it join. Right? What else? Because chances are in that join, we do any kind of network overhead of like, inserting into the ring, whatever, whatever other fancy stuff we end up putting on here. Does a joining pair have any other need to talk to a existing pair? Not really. I mean, that's from what we've seen. Those are the two major, major times, right? Okay. So, um, We have an existing peer, and we have another existing peer. Why would they talk to each other? Consolidate. Yeah. So it might have consolidate, right? And we can consider sending back to the master kind of the final consolidate message. What else? What's that? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know. Do we consider, that's, that's a good point. Do we consider a peer that's finding its orientation peer a peer? This, I think this is better. Why is that better? This covers the scenario I was about to bring up. What's another reason a peer might talk to another peer? What's that? Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. What's another reason? <laughs> On top of that. So what's an easy way to get it to do more work? Be oriented, right? Just do an orient run again, and you'll get splits off that, right? Now, that brings up something else. Do we always want to orient a peer that asks, asks us for orientation? We should have a termination con condition in there, right? We don't want to get down to splitting two different, <laughs> you know, two two of the whys and giving them one and us doing one and then them doing the, you know, our final one. So why not uh, orient it to some extent find another peer who wants? Yeah, maybe, maybe find a new orientation peer, right? So on this peer join operation, we need to have like a threshold J, right, that we're willing to split, right? So we need to do J equals this, right, and we need to check if, if, if j, right, if n minus j is greater than a threshold, right? And we'll call this, uh, I guess, work block threshold. Minimum work block. Then, if it is greater, We'll split, right? So we'll say uh, give z j to n, right? To the peer. Else, we'll just refuse. And go find somebody else to orient. I have a question. If it's a new peer, and you don't really know much about it, what would you tell a new peer up here? Yeah. Because hopefully in our join operation, 
we've joined into the network so we can start doing stuff like finding peers. So we do need a mechanism for finding a random peer. So we need, so we have the pipes, right? We have the pipe communication, right? We have, uh, you know, joining, like a joining operation, but we also need a find random peer type operation. These are basic kind of network services that we need for a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so I mean that ORIAN is pretty good because we can reuse it, right? Once you've joined, you become a regular peer, and then you ORIENT. So every time, so basically you ORIENTing isn't because you just joined. You ORIENTing is because you have no work, right? Now the only difference between this guy orienting and this guy orienting is this guy probably doesn't even have the program or anything like that, right? So on this peer, or this peer orient, we can also honor requests for uh, for the fix for fixed data, and that's stuff like our program, our map, and stuff like that. So, leaving. Okay. So the ideal leaving would be what? Right. So the ideal leaving would be you. Right. So you you. Tell somebody you're leaving. Okay. This will need to be one of our kind of primitives to take us out of the peer-to-peer the -peer network. Right, so we probably want to want to consolidate, right? Because that'll give our, our, our values back. Okay? Now If we're past threshold, consolidating to the main peer might be good, right? Because they're going to need it to finally anyway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what else would we want to notify people of? What else do we have that they're interested in? We have work assignment. If we're leaving. We need to give that work to somebody, right? Now. That's a problem. We have a real nifty way of getting rid of work. Right? So one thing we could do is we could just give somebody another set. Right? That's all right. Right? That's all right, but... What does that do here? Well, now we have a set of Z's that we need to worry about. That may not be too bad. We could do it. Um, what are some other options? Oh, they don't have. Yeah, that's that. That would be another good situation. Is no, somebody has no work, and you catch them right before they work, and you give them. <laughs> Right, you give them, uh, give them all your all your work that you're doing. That yeah, I mean, who knows? We might want to build that into the leaving protocol. Is I don't know. Yeah. No glitches. Another person to send it back to would be the person who gave it to you. Because what could they do? Move that back, right? They could just well, move their J. Like well, you got it from the person that they gave the way to second, right? Because you have you have the tail block of someone. Yeah. Because that's the only way that work gets out there is breaking out the tail block. Well, like say I give it to them, and then they oh, and then they off. give off another tail. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Right. right. So if we go back to them, they'll say, I don't have that. Right. 
Um, we might have some other options. One of our options is not tell anybody about our work. Just throw it away. Which might be a better option. Why? Because are we always going to get this? Sometimes they're going to cut their computer off, right? So, let's get into that. Let's say they do just cut their computer off. So that work is lost. How do we compensate for that? What's the easy way? We don't know they're gone. And assign it to who? We could do redundancy. It's too hard. Let's not do that yet. <laughs> it's a form of redundancy, though. Okay, and if they're not up? That's a great way to do it, right? Is we already have all the data, and to us it's just moving J. When we get to J, before we try to reorient, let's see if somebody is working on J through N. Okay? If they're not, let's just do them. Let's just you know continue going and we'll just basically move J to N. Oh no. J to N, that will definitely probably do, that will almost positively do redundant work at that point, right? Yeah. That's okay. That is okay. Mm, I'd rather be doing better work, right? Less redundant work. Because if we're going to add on redundancy, we should do that kind of as a separate thing. So that way we can get good redundancy. In other words, redundancy for stuff that we're, we'll probably need it for. Um, but I don't know. So one thing is, is that when we get done, we kind of have this, like, after this, after we consolidate out for, we kind of have this reorient step, right? So on reorientation, we may want to continue if nobody is working on J through N. Or, like, for redundancy, if people are working on, in other words, if we can't find anybody who has work to give us, we might as well calculate J through N, right? We're not doing anything else, right? <laughs> so we might as well do that redundant work just in case somebody breaks off or something like that, right? Um, but one thing we do need is a way to find up here working on a range, right? So in other words, given a value, given a number, right? A J. Can we at, we need to be able to ask the peer to peer network, what do you know about J? And it'll say, oh, this peer is working on it. Right? So we need a um, search for peer working on, say, J. Or we maybe an interval and anything falling in that interval or. <laughs> right, but something along those lines. Um, so let's talk more about this reorientation case. What should the protocol be here? I get done with all my work. I actually still have additional work in my cache because I was breaking off chunks of chunks of work for other people. Right. Um, <coughs> Which of my questions and answers be as far as the protocol is? Because protocol is nothing but go through these steps and you'll end up doing something eventually. Say if someone is working on it and is not working on it. Okay, so the first question we'll check is so this is reorient. One of the first things we'll check is. Um, Is anyone working? Or you say who's responsible for that range? Yeah, so. I'm J through N. Yeah, so who's responsible for J through N? 
And is that pure up? Okay. So who's working on J through N? Or is that actually is anyone working on J through N? Because we don't care who as long as somebody's working on it, right? Who's responsible for it? Are they live? What are the two options? Yes. <laughs> right? And no. No? What do we do? Move J to N. So here we will <coughs> J equals N. Easy enough. And then we start calculating and going on. And then we can fall back into our regular stride and we'll break it up and stuff like that. All right? Yes. Okay, so if yes, we're not responsible for it anymore, right? Um, so we need to just find random one. Right, we could do a regular reorient at that point, right? So we'll do regular reorient. Yeah. And that's what we want to degrade to. We want to degrade to the original person just calculating everything. Okay? So that can actually work for right. us in some ways as far as what's that? What if they done it and they already get you know, give given it back to the first person? Is it done? <laughs> right? Is it done? So um Do we need two different, <clears throat> we might need two different messages of, like a state for these ranges, right? In progress or, so more than search for peer working on I, we need state of I, kind of, ah. What is the state of Z J through N? <laughs> What's the state of J through N? So there's a lot of different answers that can come out of that, right? Especially if we do a range. What are the answers to what is the state of J through N? Okay, so J through N could be completely free, right? So it could be free. Let's start with the all or nothings, right? It could be free. It could be done. Or it could be progress and progress. What are the other variations? A chunk of it, right? So what are the chunks it could be? It could be the front, it could be the back, or it could be the middle. Right? And each of those could have a state. <clears throat> yeah. What about this? How about um, we can return a set of ranges one of the tri states. How can we return it to the origin? Or did we ever say we were going to return it to the Well, this is just kind of some of our legwork that we do before we have to know whether or not we need to go talk to some peer or whatever. So the first step in our what is the state is probably talk to our original oriented peer, whoever gave, whoever we got this from. I don't know if we want to track that or not. Or if it's easier to just do a general search, but a general search might be hard. Might be a good heuristic in a general search. So we could return a set of different ranges in, in different states, but what do we do with those? <laughs> All right. So you could have <clears throat> all done or in progress, but it could be a set of right of uh, J zero it's a two. With what? With the status of J to Z to J to 
well, the people doing it, right? If you if you get this message, we'll see it from the other side too, because if you receive a message, what's the state of J through N? You'll look at your stuff and you'll say, oh, I'm done with J through I, but I through N is still in progress, but I am responsible for it. Yeah, somebody would either know or they'd run through this of, I got nothing, it's free, right? I have, eventually somebody would run into the half, right? <laughs> and even if it's the final, even if it's the original project leader. It could be, it could be. Hopefully it is because that means we have a lot of peers, right? But the, as much as we can keep it together, we keep it together because that makes our loop easier and all that stuff. Because, I don't know, because if we can do a good job with this, we actually don't need to turn this into a set, which would be great, right? If we can not turn this into a set where each person's <laughs> working on multiple sets, that would be good, because we don't want to, that way we never have to deal with these individual values, you know? If, if we can keep them in blocks, that helps with our consolidation, that helps with, with tracking what we're working on. And I mean, it's really just a matter of, even though there might be some free block in here, I'm just going to concentrate on what I'm doing. When I get done with that, I'll go through some of these protocols to kind of get more info on what I need to work on. Right? So you'll get tuples back of, we'll say, state. Right? And then we'll have a state. So we get these tuples back. What do we do with them? <laughs> right? So what are we going to do with them? Should we just... We have some something they have. The first one. The first one's the most interesting to us, right? Why? In other words, the one with J being J, right? The J is the J that we have, and then there's some N prime that the first one represents that that block. Why is that one the most interesting? Right, in other words, we could just continue our block if we, if we do this out. So there's three states it could be in, right? It could be free, right? And if it's free, just move J, right? So if it's free, we do J equals, oh, no, 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 sorry, uh, N equals N0. What do I mean by that? We're actually moving it this way. Because our J is in the middle somewhere. And then that N0 is somewhere before our N. It may be our end, but that means we just return one, not a set, right? But it's somewhere less than or equal to n. So what we're doing is we're moving n back to there so that we can just work on j through through that block. In other words, we're taking over this one. Done? I say that if it's done, we just go find any, any block at that point, right? We get no benefit from doing a contiguous block anymore. Right? Because it doesn't help with our consolidating output or anything like that. Right? And then, so if it's done, just reorient. Right? What if it's in progress? You just reorient it again, probably, right? So done or well, that's interesting. We don't care about anything else. Right? 
We don't care about any of the other ranges. In other words, anything beyond J. What did I just do there? I erased stuff. Why did I erase that stuff? What is the new question? Is J what? J whatever broke up J whatever. Right, so how far past J is free? How far past J is free. So you're returning the n that's past j that's free. What's that? Oh yeah, hopefully there's a threshold there, but this is actually really hard now because if we're just really asking how far past j is free, a lot of peers might we have to find the largest n that's free, right? In other words, this. You have all these peers out there. They're all getting blocks of stuff to work on, right? I start off with everything. I give you half. Okay? You give half. I give you another quarter. Right? So we, now we're now we're all broken up, right? So we all kind of have views of that range beyond J, right? I see that as, well, I'm not responsible for it anymore, right? But you see the whole thing as some of it's in progress, right? Some of it's done, some of it's free. J is unique, but this end beyond it isn't. It's everything beyond the end of mine, which now includes. So we want to find the person. So does everybody? No, not everybody will have an interval containing J. Only one person will. Until we get into. Nodes leaving and joining. Because leaving and joining, we can throw stuff away. That's why we got into this, this problem of asking someone, is this free, right? Okay, so well, in ideal operation, one person has J, right? And, ooh. I say we throw the whole mechanism away and just reorient. Because the new person will probably start working at the beginning. So they'll automatically correct the beginning of your group and ours. Yeah. Okay. Now, we are interested in it, though, for failures. No, because again, you want duplication to be a separate mechanism, because if you're duplicating from the get-go, you're just removing performance, right? If you can't tell me what the, what the redundancy is doing, don't do it. They might have. They never got to a consolidation point. Because the thing is, is you may have calculated all of that range, but if you crash and never told anybody your answers, it's still not done. And also, you might not have J anymore. You might have 
might have given it to somebody in the lap. It's bad. All right. We need to think about that. But um, let's write this. We'll write this. Okay. We're not going to write a neuron program. What we're going to do is we're going to write an exciting program which divides up a sequence of numbers. <laughs> All right? Because if we can write a program that takes a range and dynamically degrades it out, it basically decomposes it out and assigns it to various periods as they're coming and going, we've written this out. Then you just plug in right here any module you want, right? So you have this mapping function, right, this y to abc, you make that generic, right? You have a generic way of passing that into a function stub. The function stub goes to a module which is written in a generic fashion, which has output, and then even your consolidation could probably be some sort of generic module that you can reuse. So now all of a sudden, if you could write a peer-to-peer -peer app that divides up numbers, number ranges, you've written parameter sweep apps, done. Much better than going through all this work to write one parameter sweep app, right? Writing a general parameter sweep app that has all these features, okay? <clears throat> we need to look at more scenarios, okay, of when do these things get redundant. Intuitively, I just feel there's a, there, there's a need for that, that question, being, being able to ask that question to the peer network. Okay? I don't think it's, you know, now the more that we see it, it's not along these lines, though. It's, it's more of a checking to see if that work is getting done. Right? There's, there needs to be some sort of mechanism and some sort of response to, is this work that I farmed out getting done somewhere? Right? That needs to be asked occasionally, and the best place to ask it is all, the guy you gave it to, but the best uh, the best time to ask it is when you're not doing anything. Because really, if everybody's still working, it doesn't matter that there are sections unaccounted for. Right? Because nobody can work on it right now anyway. Okay? But even more important than that, that lets peers have some leeway for failures. In other words, if a machine crashes or something and it's a transient failure, it's a fail, it's not a permanent catastrophic failure, right? It's a transient failure. If you don't, if you're not always checking to see if something's done or, or being handled, that machine may come back up and you don't incur any of the overhead of kind of reorienting all, of resituating everything, okay? But, um, but then the trade-off with that is there are going to be times when you don't have work just ready because when you get done you have to kind of situate yourself and suss out who doesn't who has work available and part of that finding work that's available will be finding these kind of unaccounted for sections okay so it may be that when it's all said and done when we go through and look at you know all the the different uh, kind of operations that we do a failure of a, of a, of a node that has work that it hasn't reassigned, we may not find that out until the end. In other words, as long as there's work available, we'll keep divvying up easily accessible work until we get to a threshold. And then when we get to that threshold, now we'll start searching out for these blocks that are unaccounted for. Okay? But we need to come up with a clean way to do that. You know, we need to come up with a very clever way to get to this point very quickly and quickly recover from it, right? Because if we can do that, if we can get it down to just this one little operation which tries to find out any failed blocks, we'll be doing really well because that's, a, that's hopefully not a common event, right? Complete failure. A common event would be joining and leaving. I mean, leaving is fine. I mean, I'm not paying you. You're welcome to leave whatever you want. But <clears throat> most of these most of these participants will do clean leaves, 
right? These leaves where you just say, I'm just getting out. So what is the state of that, that ZJ? We might change that. Maybe we can look at that question from the standpoint of somebody who's leaving, right? If you're doing a clean leave and you know you're not going to sit and wait around for all your data to get uploaded, you just want to release yourself of responsibility for a block, you may find out who's working on the rest of that block and then give them the work back without any of the consolidation or anything, right? So that might be another operation that we put in there, this idea of a, a, a semi, a semi bad leave, right? <laughs> right? Like a half bad leave where you have the courtesy to unjoin from the peer network and return your blocks that you're responsible for but you don't want to waste time uploading data and stuff like that because you're trying to close your laptop and go home or something, right? So you just do that, that quick leave and then come back. Um, the other scenario we need to think about is um, what about peers, new peers that join the network that have work they were working on, right? Ideally, they'll be able to continue that work. So are there things we can do to prefer blocks of work that we know nobody's dealing with? Okay. Um, anything else? What is that? Oh, grapes? Oh, okay. So... It wouldn't? No. Why is that? I haven't, I haven't looked at all of Grape yet. Okay, because it, it's, is it trying to exploit locality? It tries yeah. to keep groups yeah. together, right? Yeah. How would, how would we exploit locality in this app? But there's also another aspect to this that has locality. What's the locality that we're talking about here? Each of those ranges are locales. Right? In other words, think of it this way. Divide the whole range among super nodes and have super nodes farm out, farm out the sub ranges of those to its peer groups. What that does is all of those peers failing and leaving and stuff, you keep locality and keeping the, in other words, who's the best person to take over the, the failed nodes block? Well, the person who just gave it out, right? We ran into a problem here with ours because we just get, we lose track of so much stuff of where the blocks are and, you know, that person's probably, and like some of these super nodes, they might start toggling people of starting from the beginning or starting from the end. Maybe we can do that, you know? In other words, whenever you give out a block, maybe a block has an orientation. Right? Do you, know, do you know what I mean by that? If you have 0 through 10, 0 through 5, wherever you cut it, the orientation is from the tips, right? From the outside tip. So if I cut it in half, I'll give, I'm doing 0 through 5 ascending, right? And I give you 10 through 6, uh, you know, I'm doing 0 through 4 ascending, and I give you 5 to 10 uh, descending. So when you split, you'd be doing the descending and you'd give somebody else ascending. <laughs> or would you still give them descending? I don't know. No, you'd give them ascending. Because that screws over the guy who initially gave you a block, but it helps you out in that you can continue if that guy doesn't get done. See, if we did something like that, then our what is the state, we get back to that thing of just extending an index as opposed to transferring anything and things like that. Because every time we do that, every time we work on a contiguous block, it saves us also in the consolidation, right? Because we have this whole contiguous block of finished work. And we're not we're not tracking any other things. And we actually get rid of a lot of the orientation messages and stuff like that. We just move an index. Okay? So um what are the main things we need to write? Something like this, right? Something to load a module and run it. Okay. We have joining. 
We have some joining operations, right? Basically, these protocols. Right? These are protocol operations, right? We have join, we have consolidate, orient, leave, right? In that, we have primitives that we're using in there to accomplish that that negotiation, right? So we need to kind of we need to determine kind of what's all the information I need to gather gather before I do this. In other words, there's sets of things that we we do in these operations in that the first part of it is talking to the network. We're finding out things about who has what and where I need to go. And then once I find who I need to talk to, there's some sort of consolidate protocol that says Here's how much data I have. I'm sending it to you so that you can make a bigger block or whatever. Or if it turns out that I have a bigger block than you, you should send me your data. That might be a good consolidate protocol, right? And then once we, in other words, whichever one has the least amount of data should send it to the one with the more data so that they can pass their threshold and send it back to the main queue. That might be a decent protocol, right? Orient. This whole the program, the map, and stuff like that. Do we want to make those three separate, or you know, like two separate orient messages? I don't know. Okay, that might be better is to do a, a, a constants orient message and then a work unit orient message. You know, maybe break this up into two sub protocols. Right. The reason being is that you don't necessarily want the overhead of hey, uh, do you have all the the program and the the constants? because I can send them to you every single time you talk to somebody. You might want that to be a separate protocol message, get that stuff, and then do a, just a work-oriented uh, message that's separate. Leaving, we have those kind of you know sub-protocols of uh, a leave with consolidation, a leave without consolidation, right? Um, and then also the join protocol, we have, multiple, we have a couple scenarios there. One is the regular fresh node join, the other is jo a node joining that was already in the peer group and was working at one point. Because that join may be able to just continue working on the block that it had. Okay. And then we also need to write, this is basically the other side of this protocol, right? We need to do two sides, the client and the server side of, of, of these different protocols. Okay. Um, what else? The consolidation routine. We want to make that separate for two reasons. One is it makes designing and writing the software easier, but even more importantly, it makes it modular so that we can reuse you know, a consolidation kind of mechanism and make it generic, right? So that we can use it in any kind of app. Really, even apps outside of Perimeter Suite, just anything that has accumulation of results and then sending it out. Okay? Um, These primitives, right? These primitive operations that we can, that we're going to be using to kind of accomplish these protocols. Okay, some of them we get, some of them we need to, we need to design around more basic primitives. Okay, um, threads, lots of threads, right? We want a main work thread. We want something to kind of manage our, our participation in the peer group. Right at the network, more at the peer network level, we want something to to kind of uh, manage our participation in the peer mm -hmm. group at the application level. Right for this particular application, uh, we probably want a separate consolidation thread. Okay. Um, who likes what? Because luckily, we're such good software engineers, we thought of all this stuff modularly and everything so we can separate out that work and everybody writes a small standalone piece that has you know, perfect unit testing that we can just plug them all together and it all works on the first shot. That's how it works. And we have tons of framework we can build on if we want to build on like Jetstone and things like that. I prefer that just because it takes away a lot of the network Who likes what? We need some sort of kind of, one of the big threads is going to be the, this, you know, a lot of the network communication thread. You know, setting up these pipes, 
transferring these, these fixed size messages between peers, that kind of thing. The person who's doing, like, for example, some of the other things, like consolidation should see things as I'm accumulating results, sorting them if I need to or whatever, finding out what the ranges are, seeing if they're the threshold, but then they just pass it on to the kind of the generic communication service to, to get rid of it. Same with the, um, you know, this kind of thing. We might be able, we might have to work off some primitives and send it to the communication thread so that it can handle, you know, finding out these things, but it will just return, here's the state of this, you know, range, or uh, here's the, you know, the main threshold or whatever. Who wants more low-level network communication oriented? You'd like to do that? All right, then that's what you need to look into. Um, juxta, setting up pipes, um, finding peers, what do, what kind of built-in primitives of search functionality do we have as far as like the session-oriented kind of finding a peer, setting up a pipe, transferring a file, what kind of feedback comes from come, comes back from that? How can we take some of those primitive messages and turn them into these join messages, leaving messages, um, both at the fundamental juxta level will be pretty much automatic, but in our application level stuff, we need to make sure we need to know what primitives we want to use to, to, to do that. Does everybody know what I mean? Juxta is giving you you know basic things like transferring you you know like datagrams or streams and stuff like that, but those primitives, those that primitive functionality, we turn into protocols by just putting messages in them like that we know what both sides are going to say. So concentrate on a standalone thread that kind of just has this just talking back and forth with the peers and very and, and design how you want that to be interfaced with by these other modules and kind of think of the other modules of, well, this guy's going to get done with processing a bunch of stuff and he'll probably just give me a file, right? So that file, you don't have to worry about what protocol gets invoked or whatever because they'll ask you to invoke a protocol and things like that. But uh, that's going to be the difficult part of the thread is, is the, both of those sides and see how they plug together using Juxta. All right. Um, this producer type of module of a generic mechanism of loading up a Java module, you know, a Java class that we don't know what the class is or anything like that, loading it in, running in this loop, and orienting it to these these parameters. In other words, um, pretty much from here to here, you need a clean in and a clean out. That this part's going to be separate because that's going to be part of some of the work decomposition portion, right? But this part right here, where this is generic. Okay, that's going to include a module that not only runs this actual work, you know, the workhorse of the of, of the of the application where it runs the actual code, but for example, uh, translating a work unit Y into ABC for input into that. That's part of that, right? All these custom pieces that you load, you know, from like say a jar, right? Where there's some standard interfaces that you can interface with those pieces so that you can load the parameters, run it through a run, get the output. Who wants it? Plug in infrastructure essentially. Yeah, like, yeah, with, with being able to, I mean, even, you won't be able to take advantage because it has like, network functionality of finding those things out there. But we need to interface with the network side, getting this jar or finding it and identifying it in some way and then pulling it in, loading it, and, and running it separately. Okay. okay. And then we have this work degrader, this work decomposer. Okay. Um, the hardest part of the work decomposer, I think, is going to be, it's going to be the part that's going to be hammered by all the threads, okay? In the sense that it's going to be mucking around with the data of the work module, 
right? Changing its inputs on the fly, okay? It's going to be talking with the network portion, you know, being, you're going to have to be able to lock uh, your view of the range that you have, do your calculations, split it, put those parameters back into the work module, send your answers over to the, the network module, and then basically have your orientation ready for that, that network module. Okay? So, yeah, you can play every other part. So, the big thing is, is the, 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 the decomposer isn't that, isn't that hard. It's pretty much along those lines. The hard part is finding out everywhere we need to lock everything and what inputs and outputs are going to go between. So, um, I don't know. Can I get some email? Questions on that? What's that? Next class we should be, we should have a working on <laughs> um, You need to look through that. You need to look through these kind of, these steps, these protocols, and you need to start imagining what you're going to run into. Like, for example, especially you, like, you're going to have to imagine what are these other threads are running and what data are they getting and how are they going to communicate with me? What do I need to lock? Um, do you guys have like a lot of multi any multi-threaded experience? Like a little bit? Because what's that? Okay. Because the simplest thing in multi-threaded can sometimes get ornery and you don't even you didn't even think it would be. You know, like the simplest thing of but I mean the, the biggest thing is it's a small function. Every single variable you need to you have to you need to think about is this being accessed by multiple pieces and who's accessing it and who do I need to lock against? Okay, because basically, since you're kind of that center portion of these kind of uh, of where the threads kind of all come together, you, you kind of need to say, oh, and it, whenever you're gonna have to wrap all your calls to this particular variable because I'm gonna you know if you ever change that while I'm doing it. Know, everything gets popped up. So uh, that's the kind of thing you're, you're in charge of is looking at how other people are going to be talking to you so that you can tell them and you can yourself lock those variables and, and basically just set up kind of the semaphore model for all the, the, you know, the, mutual, the mutex model for all of the, the rest of the pieces. Okay. Um, Need to get dynamic modules loading up. One of the things to think about is checking, to, you know, is, is, is verifying, you know, all the uh, Java should have a lot of built-in mechanisms for verifying the, you know, integrity of the module you're loading, things like that. What our limitations are is think of which parts of this thing are actually dynamic in order to make this thing generic, so that we can do any sort of parameter sweep at work. Writing a new parameter sweep app for our platform would be writing a a simple Java class implementing a particular interface, done. You know, you do that, sign it, put the key on the network, done. Right? If you can do that, I mean, this this all of a sudden becomes very interesting as opposed to just, uh, you know, again, writing an app that can divide a, se a, se a sequence of numbers all of a sudden becomes a very powerful parameter sweep app. Okay? Uh, and the protocol primitives, you need to suss out what, what do we have the capability of saying with Juxta and, and what, your, what your ideas are for how we build these additional protocols that are gonna that, that we're gonna need to do. So you know, keep an eye on those 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 kind of may, really four basic protocols that we're gonna need to do, so that you can say what pieces of information we need from each, and then you know we'll see where we get that information, whether it's from the output or the input to these different work modules, and you know all this and you know what we need to lock when we get into it. All right. Um, also, I'll send out a link. Um, I've been recording my lectures and then hinting them so that they can be, you know, just fed off the, the web server. So 